Okay, the title of the reading is called Raised Consciousness. The first commandment. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And that is taken from Exodus chapter 20. Moses lived in Egypt over 3,000 years ago, and he led some 600,000 people out of Egypt and through the wilderness. That is historical. But Moses also stands for a faculty in yourself. And the things that Moses did typify your states of mind. The mountain means prayer, the elevated consciousness. We are told that the general public were not allowed to go up Mount Sinai, but that does not mean that certain people were not good enough to go up. It means that if we want to go up the mountain, if we want to raise our consciousness, if we want to get closer to God, we must prepare ourselves by prayer. If we want to go up the mountain, we have to become a high priest spiritually, and we must rid ourselves of our faults and weaknesses. Otherwise, we cannot elevate our consciousness and get our contact with God. Moses had his revelation, and then he realized it as the experience that God and man are one. And when he got that revelation, Moses brought back the laws of life, beginning with the first commandment, as we call it. What is the beginning of the first commandment? I am the Lord thy God. Our trouble in our religious life nearly always is that we think in the beginning me. That is very human, but it does not get us the revelation that Moses got. After affirming I am the Lord thy God, the first commandment says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Earlier this week, I read that and it struck me with such force how easy it is to find ourselves worshiping other gods, putting other gods before the divine one. It reminded me of something that a woman that I know told me from her faith walk, and I don't know what her faith walk is, but I have asked her to do a talk. She said that their leader says, that which is hidden inside us is that which governs the outcome of our lives. And reading Emmett Fox, Thou shalt not put other gods before me, I realized that, that there was the equivalent there. That when we put other things as more important, make them gods, if you will, then we are, in effect, limiting our ability to climb the mountain to ultimately connect with the divine. And I found myself over time thinking of teachings from other people I've known. Um, Sister Pepper, the founder of our, what was our home church, talk, would talk about the rich man who wanted to join Jesus. And Jesus said, first you must give up all that you hold dear. And the rich man went away defeated because he held so much dear. And Sister Pepper would say, what do we hold tighter to us than anything else? It's our beliefs. And then a little later came into to my mind something that Quakers, and I am a Quaker, 
believe that we come into this world innocent, directly connected to the divine, to divine love. And it is the experiences in our world from the, I'll say from the point of conception on that tarnish us, uh, create barriers for us to be connected with divine love, with all that is part of our inheritance, part of our being as divine beings. And it's a process. Um, I don't know how many of you have experienced it with a child or children, but I've had two or three experiences where talking with a child under age five, the child begins talking about something that clearly, clearly is outside normal human understanding. In one case, uh, the child was sitting next to me, we were eating and all of a sudden she's talking about uh, back when she was big and she was working and she hurt her hands. I think she said burnt her hands and they wouldn't let her work anymore and she couldn't eat and she got very hungry. Well, it happened that I had been reading about Victorian era working conditions with that week. And boy, that just hit right to the nub. And another case, it was not one I experienced personally, but a, a friend of mine told me about how her daughter at age three said, remember when I was the man and you were the woman and I was riding a big horse and I rescued you from the bad people. This world gets in the way of our ability to connect to all that is on the other side. And every one of us, I think without, with minimal exceptions, you know, Mother Teresa might be an exception, uh, the Peace Pilgrim might be an exception, but virtually every one of us is holding some gods in front of our connection with the Divine One. And the range can be so great. I, I've been thinking about this and I'm going to mention types of false gods. Please understand that this isn't the beginning of a, uh, a whole list. This is just what I've thought of in my own limited way. So first of all, how might we define what is a false God, a God that is outside our connection with the ultimate divine. Um, I have at this point, two ideas, two metrics. One is, is that belief one which leads us away from experiencing or offering or being able to give that divine agapeic love for every human being, such as the Quakers talk about, since every human has that spark of God within. Another criterion might be, does our connection, our belief in this false God, unbalance our wheel of life? The wheel of life, depending on who you talk to, has many segments, you know, there's family, financial, intellectual, spiritual, physical, uh, and there's two or three others, I'm not thinking at the moment. And the idea is that to be a well-rounded human, to be following divinity, we need to have equal emphasis on all pieces. Otherwise, like a wheel that's out of round, our life is incomplete, is not following a directory, the a trajectory that can lead us closer and closer to the epitome of divine love, that can help us become ever better a representative of divine love on, on this earth and on the other side as we work. Because ideally, 
if we're totally connected with the divine, the other side and this side are all intertwined. You know, Tim and Lori, working with uh, you know, in training with the spiritualist church, easily see. Well, I won't say easily because I can't speak for you, but do convey information. Do connect with people who are still living on the other side. All of us have that innate capacity. But for the gods, the false gods, the hidden gods, whatever words we want to use that keep us from focusing, connecting with the one true divine. So what kinds of things are false gods can be false gods? Well, there's things that we can make as false gods. Uh, as I was thinking of this, I was reminded about a wedding I did uh, in the home of people I will take to have been lower middle class. It was a smallish 1950s-ish house. There were three brand new trucks in the driveway. And when I went in, the carpet, was, this, you know, they had maybe half a dozen kids. The carpet was shag carpet, maybe three inches deep, pure white, pure white uh, leather couch, huge flat panel TV back when that was a real novelty. And the father just couldn't wait to tell me all the wonderful things they had. They had two billiard tables, one upstairs, one downstairs, three flat screen TVs, each of which must have been worth, been worth multiple thousands of dollars and on and on and on. His love, his God, my take, was the goods they were able to afford because of his job. That was what made them feel whole and okay. Comparably, it can be how we relate to our own physical body. Another personal story, I did a wedding in a venue where there was a stairs, a winding stairs coming down from the upper floor. Um, there was no real value in it, it was just a balcony. The bride told me that she would be walking down the stairs and everyone would be facing her. We would, I and the groom would be at the bottom of the stairs. Well, when she walked, started walking, and she was very proud. She made it clear uh, to me that she was somebody. She knew all the head, all the CEOs, all the C-suites, uh, and GE and Procter and & Gamble and some others I can't remember by their first names. She could call them if they, she needed financial advice. Um, and she was proud that at 50 or 53, she had a very good looking body. Well, when she started walking down the stairs, I realized that the gown she was wearing was cut down to her navel and the skirt was two thirds of the way up her thighs. And we were looking at her as she came down the stairs. There wasn't anything hidden. She was making sure that her God was visible to be admired. You can also worship a body because of its illness. In my work with Lift on Therapy, I've worked with several where what was important to them was how sick they were. And as we worked within it, it was because by being unwell consistently, they believed they could finally feel loved. So a distraction, a, a, a look away from divine love. Then there's, of course, things intangible that you can worship. There are experiences, for instance. Um, there are people who pursue one type of experience or another to the detriment of other parts of their lives. I remember in particular um, a fellow who was a world-class mountain climber and who would not give up mountain climbing even when he was well past his peak and died falling off a mountain that he should not have been on in the first place. But that he was so enamored of, he was rigid. So perhaps another element to consider in what is your false God? Are you rigidly connected to this belief or this need? Um, another intangible leadership or the ability to have power or manipulate others. You know, managers of various kinds. Uh, this uh, a, a fact of many studies that um, well over 50% of people in upper level management, major corporations 
are psychopaths and sociopaths. They are valued because they have no ethics except to make the corporate better. So the, um, the ability to manipulate others, that would even include uh, people who are abusive in relationships. To them, that is the most important thing. They're not willing to give it up. Now then there's issues of status. Is there a kind of status that you worship? Um, and I, please understand, I'm not challenging any of you. I'm looking at the broader. Uh, I knew a Cincinnatian who was invited to move to a, uh, to a major East Coast hospital in Boston uh, to work with a, a well-known physician there. And she lasted, I think, all of nine months. She came back sort of shaking her head saying, everybody there is on an ego trip. Everyone's trying to outdo the other in the newest car or the most prestigious uh, the most prestigious preschool for their kid and bragging about it. So there, one of the gods, and you can have more than one false god. Uh, one of those was bragging rights, prestige. Status would be one that you can brag about. Uh, the, the gal I mentioned who was wearing so little as a, guy, as a bridal gown yeah, she was, you're making sure you, you knew that she knew all these powerful people. Another kind uh, of status is flaunting your wealth. Or in some cases in the Midwest, can, uh, interestingly enough, um, your goal is, or your goddess is to be wealthy without flaunting it so nobody knows. Uh, another kind of uh, intangible is if you will, distractions, uh, workaholism. You, you know, if, if you are emphasizing pushing uh, all the work you do, and I might be guilty of this one, and that is what makes you okay. Okay, that's something to be concerned about. Um, what about a news junkie? who has the news channel on 24 seven. What about people who spend their whole life do-gooding even at the cost of their own family? Is that their God? What about uh, people, hypochondriasts, for whom no illness is too small or too large to imagine that you got it and to tell other people about it? And then there's the idea of I'm better than you are, self-aggrandizement, I'm okay, you're not okay. Is that what you're worshiping? That you need to show that you are more okay than others. I'm more accomplished than you. I'm more special than you. Uh, I'm smarter than you are examples. Are there ideas, are there beliefs that you're holding on as the rich man that Sister Pepper would refer to too tightly? Because the divine, as you've heard me say before, is not constricted by rules or by our beliefs. Um, so are you holding on too tightly to a belief or set of beliefs about religion, about God, about how the world works? Um, I was working with someone who's, if I can say, who worshiped the idea of first you suffer and then you die. And that was what their whole world was focused on, uh, if you will. Um, so we've got all these different possibilities and ones I haven't even thought of yet. And all of us, or almost all of us, will have some belief or beliefs or other thing that we worship. You can even worship being strange. Something back before I became more well that I certainly did. But how do you find it? How do you find it? And as I was discussing this with Phyllis, Phyllis had some wonderful ideas. So this is a joint presentation. And Phyllis? <laughs> Okay, well, Brian shared the, 
his notes with me and I posed some questions and I along the topic and um, I guess the one uh, question I had was okay so how is your prayer life um, I think it's it's in our and I speak to myself when I bring this question forth and um, because I think that we need to realize that uh, through our prayer life and our connection with God and our learning to be still and learning through that process, we can hear um, God's voice speaking to us uh, metaphorically or for real and uh, leading us. So it's, you know, um, in the morning these days, uh, well, new grandchild this week on Tuesday morning. So since then I've been extremely busy um, helping out with kids and trying to be supportive. And honestly, my prayer life kind of suffered a little bit. <clears throat> well, my, and I was kind of grateful that I had been taking time prior to that. And it, it happens to all of us where things happen in life where we're either taking care of someone who's sick that we're close to and we need to be available to them or we're taking care of young people or whatever it is we're kind of it, it can get kind of challenging um and so uh i uh, personally i have found on my mornings when i'm when i'm able to be still and take the time um that things go better with prayer that I'm I feel led more in those days to either people or situations where I can be a uh, loving uh, support you know or just be present and um, the other piece I'm thinking about is this idea of how am I taking care of myself you know when it's time to rest am I resting um, am I eating nutritious food uh, so that, you know, my brain can work properly and I have the right energy? Um, I don't do that perfectly, but it's something I think that uh, is important to our lives is, is, you know, you have to put the mask on first. How are you putting your mask on first? Are you getting your right sleep? Are you getting the right nutrition? You know, and we're learning that exercise is so important to keeping ourselves in good health. And so um, we are whole beings. We're not, deep, we're not uh, just a brain or just a body. We are, are all systems work together. And so um, I think we have to recognize all the uh, the parts that make this whole being, our whole being function well um, to do the good work that we're called to do. And I think that's all I got to say on that. Okay. So I'm going, so I'm going to move into sort of a personal conversation here. As I've been thinking about this, I've been asking myself, okay, what, what gods am I worshiping that are keeping me away from being on the mountain, closer to God, living in the pure divine love? And I'm struggling. Partly, I think, because I don't really want to acknowledge what I think I'm seeing. Partly because it's not altogether clear. I think most of you who are here today know that I come from a really dysfunctional family and may, in fact, uh, certainly have the symptoms of someone with high-functioning Asperger's or high-functioning autism, however you want to call it. I think I'm slowly 
coming to the conclusion that my God might be fear, fear of things that I don't understand. You know, we have this new grandchild and I, I do not do well with family. I have no sense of it. And with this new grandchild, more is asked of me and I am frankly terrified. Now that's more than before when I just shut it off. So I'm beginning to deal with it, but I still one way or another have to, have to find a way of coming to more peace and less terror around family. That's one God, maybe two gods that I have before the divine one. And those two are big enough. I haven't found any others yet, but I have no doubt that they're there. As I mentioned before, I think I used to have as a God, the idea of being strange, acting strange to stay safe, but I don't think I do that anymore. But I'm going to be evaluating. So you'll probably hear more from me on this as, as I figure things out, just to, to share my own journey toward finding where my hidden gods, my false gods are. So let me close with a couple of quotes that I think fit in our in the walk of each of us toward identifying where our false gods are or where are where are our weaknesses towards false gods because once one element of false gods as i think i mentioned toward the top is how certain we must be about them you know because the true divine we can be certain only in our uncertainty. The true divine does not give us hard rules, is not easily painted on canvas. We can paint, you know, we can see paintings of representatives of Jesus, for instance, of Mary. But we all know when we see a picture of God that that's just a cartoon. So a quote from John Stuart Mill, to question all things, never to turn away from any difficulty, to accept no doctrine either from ourselves or from other people without rigid scrutiny. And from the Brothers of Purity, a Muslim sect who in 1000 AD made the first attempt to, wrote, to write a universal encyclopedia. Shun no sky science, scorn no book, nor cling fanatically to a single creed. If we do any of the things recommended against here, we are likely to be also blind, more blind to where our false gods are. And for our walk to the divine, to become more one with the great God of love. We cannot do that and be doctrinaire. Mother, Father, God, we thank you for the gathering today. We thank you for the, the thoughts that Brian and Phyllis and all of us have shared uh, this evening. We thank you for each other. We thank you for the healing that you bring upon us. We thank you for your love. We ask that you walk with us during this week and allow us to accept ourselves, love ourselves, and to be the best we can be. We ask this through all that's good. Amen.